welcome back to Whiteboard Series. It's been a unfortunate break due to Corona, but we're back now that things are getting back to normal. And I have Joel here from Ceramic to really dive in into how Ceramic works. So Joel, please introduce yourself and let's dive in. Cool, thank you. Uh, so my name is Joel, I'm co-founder and CTO at 3Box Labs, and we're really kind of the creators of, of Ceramic Network. Um, and yeah, I guess let's dive in. So maybe before this, like, which problem Ceramic is solving? That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Ceramic is, is a protocol for mutable data objects where you have objects that live in the centralized network and they have like a controller, some user that uh, can change and mutate the object over time. Essentially like get a history of like how the, the, the object was changed over time and you get like kind of like an immutable kind of uh, log of like what has happened. Um, and these objects are independently verifiable. So you, you don't need to kind of sync the state of an entire blockchain to validate the state of like one object. Uh, so that's kind of like very high level of, of ceramic. Just uh, like decentralized object store that people can use, but then with kind of auditable log. Yeah, exactly. You can rely on. Uh -huh. All right. Cool. All right, so are we ready to dive in? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so, so we have a, 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 a log is made up of these events, mm -hmm. sometimes called commits. And so we start creating an object by uh, creating a Genesis uh, event. And this, this event might be just a data object that contains, uh, okay, how to best visualize this? We have like a controller. And this is basically like the user ID. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, we might dive into this deep, deeper. The DID is like a, a abstract way of representing a a user in a in a decentralized network, and then it ha might have like just some other metadata. Um, all right. So so once we have this, we've generated the the stream ID based on this. This is kind of the unique identifier of, of an object in Ceramic. Mm -hmm. So now um, a user can go about creating a, an, um, an update uh, that is a signed commit. And that is also, um, uh, so, so all of these objects are stored in IPLD. And IPLD is essentially a way to represent hash linked data. Mm -hmm. uh, so this object has a pointer that points to the hash of the Genesis object. And this uh, commit contains a signature uh, issued by the users. And uh, that's essentially it. Then it contains a patch for like how the which object is updated. So in, in Ceramic right now, we have support for something we'll call a tile document, which is a, essentially like a JSON mm -hmm. uh, object. Um, and the patch is just a JSON patch. Uh, so you have a JSON patch. Um, and then these signed commits can be, you know, added over time, uh, and they link back and create this kind of like event log. Uh, and then, in order to um, kind of get some kind of real sense of time into the system, because without this, you kind of need to like either trust completely, like if there's timestamps, if the user puts a timestamp mm -hmm. in there. So we have um, another system that basically creates something called anchor commits or anchor events. Uh, so this is uh, we can call it a. And this also points back to the previous one. Uh, and this essentially contains some uh, metadata information that's um, um, like which chain, chain ID uh, mm -hmm. it was anchored to, and like a transaction hash. And it usually, so, so this is usually done by an, some kind of anchor service that can like take a bunch of updates to a bunch of different streams, generate a Merkle tree and put the root on chain. So usually it contains like a, um, a Merkle witness as well. Does a Merkle witness across a bunch of object? Yeah, so there might, imagine like this, this mm -hmm. kind of stream, there are multiple of these, like yeah. there are multiple objects that are updated by multiple users. So an anchor service is essentially like uh, an actor in the network that uh, takes requests from users mm -hmm. um, and takes uh, this, you know, the sign commit and uh, batches a bunch of those into uh, a Merkle tree and puts the root on chain. And then it kind of gives back this anchor commit that contains like, this was anchored on this chain ID. Right now uh, it's Ethereum mainnet, transaction hash, uh, and a Merkle, like a path through the, um, through the Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and yeah, and then like you can continue updating the um, the the stream like this. Um, so this is kind of the data structure. Mm -hmm. And so a ceramic node, um, basically either you create the stream on that node, so um, then you have kind of all this data. Uh, when you make an update to one of the streams, uh, you, you publish an update in a libpdp uh, pubsub network uh, so that anyone can kind of, that is interested in a stream can like update and sync that stream. Um, and uh, yeah, that's essentially it. Like, and, th and then like the, the second part of this is um, we have a, a query system that allows you to, if you're a new node in the network, you want to sync any particular stream, you can, you know, you, ha you have the stream ID, mm -hmm. you want to find what the latest um, commit is or what the latest update is. Uh, so if, to do that, you basically um, look into, um, we, right now, like in, in, the, in this, we use the IPFS DHT mm -hmm. and basically put, uh, say, saying a node that pins the stream, basically says, hey, I have this stream ID, put it in the DHT and then put their, their so the, the IPFS DHT basically works like, you know, you, you say you have an object and then you put your uh, IP address or like your multi-address into the DHT. So we can basically find all the peers that pin the stream and so we walk the DHT in to find all the peers that have this uh, stream and then we ask them like, hey, what's the latest update? And mm -hmm. we sync the log. Um, and then you kind of verify the history of this log from the beginning to, to the latest update and then reduce the state based on that. Mm -hmm. I haven't done any questions. <laughs> Great. Um, so I guess let's start with, with the last thing you said, which is, let's say I, I want to find the latest state of an, of an object. Mm -hmm. um, and so how frequently are this, like I'm assuming pretty much the way for me to determine if this is the latest state or not is to look for anchor uh, commits. Like if I'm getting like from multiple nodes, I'm getting different states. Yeah. So if you get different states, there is a conflict resolution. Yeah. And so uh, I think uh, so, so that basically is based on uh, uh, for like uh, earliest anchor mm -hmm. rule. So if you have to, uh, if we have uh, uh, a stream here, I'm going to represent it upwards instead. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have one commit here and one commit Actually, here. Be this way. Sorry? So the camera can see that. You can see it? Okay. Great. And then so so let's say there is like one anchor commit here. Mm-hmm. And then the other anchor commit is like later. This means that if if these you get these two branches, uh, and there might be like other commits after here. Mm -hmm. um, you will resolve to this, um, th this basically, this conflict logic will say like, this was anchored earliest, so this will win. Um, th that's the current kind of current conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also like looking into various ways of like merging uh, as well, uh, using CRDTs, but like this is kind of like the sim simple way of doing it. Um, and so uh, you can think of an attack on this, might be that okay, you, you, you basically publish this thing and then uh, you don't reveal this, right? Uh, and then you later reveal it and then you just kind of change the, the state. And so in a blockchain where you're tracking like financial transactions, that's a problem because then you can steal yeah, money. Can steal money yeah. um, but Ceramic is, is primarily aimed at like user-centric data. Mm -hmm. So if you do this, you kind of uh, do this and then later reveal kind of the main person that's like affected by that because this this stream ID is like controlled by you and like mm -hmm. it's controlled by your identity you're basically like basically um, revoking things you've done mm -hmm. and it's probably mostly harmful to you and your reputation that you built up on this this account well it depends how people are using it right because as yeah soon, as soon as you do some data storage people will use it for financial transactions <laughs> but yeah like for example, you know, somebody wants to publish like stock prices or updates or whatever. Like that, that's can be a data structure to do it. 
Yeah, it can be. Like, we're pretty, like, you know, trying to, like, make people, like, this is not meant for mm -hmm. financial transactions. It's meant for, like, primarily, like, user-centric data. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I guess for me to understand, like, how, how this can even happen, like, is the anchoring service just literally, like, it doesn't care and just find something and... So, so, we, so, so we run an anchoring service and we make sure that this doesn't happen, yeah. but someone else can run an anchoring service, right? Okay. Uh, there's no... Is, like, should there be a consensus on anchoring services, kind of, or...? Right, that, that might be interesting to, to explore, like, so... Um, when we decided to sign this protocol, we had this kind of like identity use case in mind. Mm -hmm. And the problem we're trying to solve with these anchors is like key ro rotations. Mm -hmm. So if you have, um, if they imagine this stream represents a, um, an, an account, a DID. Mm -hmm. So a DID is essentially a way to go from an abstract identifier to a document that contains public keys. Yeah. Um, and if you, um, if you, like have these two branches, like someone has rotated a key. Um, if we were to go with this branch, someone that steals key those like in, in the start in the start, they could potentially like, you know, create a new update in the future. Mm -hmm. And so we need to go with this kind of earliest uh, anchor rule. Um, mm -hmm. Because you wrote it like if the, the earliest rotation of the key needs to be the one that's valid. Otherwise, the, the key rotation part wouldn't be secure. Got it. Got it. So, I see. And then for, for Anchor, for this information, to get the actual timestamp, like you need to fetch the transaction from the chain, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Cool. And so, so you, you're saying, let me, let me just kind of draw how instead. So you have like a DP2P on the bottom as your uh, kind of networking stack, you mm -hmm. just pops up here. Um, this is where you have pretty much you have nodes which store kind of this um, data. Yep. Presumably anybody can publish. Yep. Yeah. So updates. Exactly. So like nodes choose which streams that they want to replicate. Track. Yeah. How, like, is there like as as a user? Like I want to store some data. How how do I tell which nodes are tracking this, or like how do I tell them to track? Um, so right now, like developers in their application configure which node that they mm -hmm. use. And so right now, it's kind of like on the developer to make sure that you know they're using it that they um, care about for their application is pinned. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so that's roughly it is like right now. Like in theory, like a user could spin up a node and replicate their data. Mm -hmm. And uh, so inside node, like, um, this, like this data stare, like you have, a, you have this log and you'd probably have just like a latest, like stream ID to latest state. state yeah, exactly. And so this, this is queryable from, from an HTTP API that the node right. exposes. Okay. And, and you said you have like a, DHT somewhere, which is stream ID to hash or to, uh, so, to IP address. Yeah, that's stream ID to node peer ID, right? Right, okay. Uh, so that's also in, in libp2p. In libp2p, okay. So presumably, a, even a web can, you know, web thing can connect to this query, find the IP address, and then request via HTTP. Yeah. Right. Or, what do you mean by web thing? Well, like a web page. Yeah, I mean, so. Yes, but like the doing like the like JavaScript implementation of libp2p is like fairly limited, but in theory it's possible. Yeah, uh, I guess like yeah, generally I guess the libp2p implementation can expose like a web socket, mm -hmm. so you could connect to that. Mm -hmm. And but crawling the DHT in, in in web is kind of fairly expensive, but it's possible. Well, I mean, you just need to. This is DHT, right? You can just query the DHT with some peers that you have. Have to make it too. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. So yeah, I mean, it would be good. Yeah, to probably dive in into DID here, mm -hmm. um, and also yeah, how like you mentioned, kind of the the DID use case using ceramic on top, right? That would be interesting as well. Yeah. So we actually like 
use this stream mm -hmm. to represent the DAD mm -hmm. that's actually also like an author of a stream. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you go meta, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so exactly. Is this DAD actually a stream so, ID? Yeah, yeah. So it could be, like it can be. Like we okay. support internally, we have we have a DAD method called 3ID, mm -hmm. and that's based on, on this. Mm -hmm. um, but we also support other DAD methods that are like based on Ethereum and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, Okay, I mean, I guess, so in general, like a DID is simply like, uh, yeah, perfect. Oh. It's a little bit loose, I think. All right. Um, do you want to raise, okay. No, oh, we can keep, ah, whatever. <laughs> the, yeah, okay, let's go. <laughs> so, so a DID is uh, very simple. Uh, yeah, can I use that? Uh, uh, you basically have um, a, an identifier. So this is a URL that's defined as DID colon and then a method and then um, an identifier. Um, and so, so this is a URL that, mm -hmm. that you resolve to a DAD document. Um, and so this document contains like um, Verification methods. Uh. So that might be, you know, a signature key, like public, public. Uh, let's or a key exchange key. So it's essentially a way to have like an abstract identifier that mm -hmm. resolves to some document that contains the public keys that are used by this DID at this point in time. Uh, so an example, uh, we have a DID method called the DID3, mm -hmm. and then it's just like, I don't know, like KJ7, that's the stream ID. Mm -hmm. And so this resolves using a ceramic stream to a DAD document that contains this type of kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, so that's that's essentially it. Like, um, basically, th there are also like DAD methods that are very simple, like DAD um, key. And this is basically uh, just how... Uh, just a key, public key, yeah. Public key in here. So that supports like... Um, you know, sick P, uh, K1. K1, it supports R1, it supports Edison Curve, yeah. uh, to file it. Yeah, it supports like BLS, yeah, it supports like most of the useful ones. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um. There's also a new one that we worked on with uh, Spruce ID that's called the PKH. Um, mm -hmm. And then it contains something called a Kype 10 account ID. And what this is, is essentially a way to represent a blockchain account mm -hmm. on any blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so an example is uh, DID uh, PKH um, EIP one five five colon one for Ethereum mainnet and then zero mm -hmm. X one two three mm -hmm. A B C and you could do something similar with near I think uh, with near we have like PKH near colon 
main net colon. I don't know how near address is usually just defined. Just near or Ilya dot near. Okay. I mean, there is like, it's pretty much a, a string. Okay. Just put you in the tough spot, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> <Spelling my name. laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Can you um, tell me like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can create any type of DAD yeah. method, right? They can. So this kind of resolves to like a DAD document that basically says like... How to verify that. Yeah, essentially. All right. And so, but like, do you have like actual code there or how does it... No, it doesn't have actual code. That's kind of like an annoying thing. This, this, you can specify verification methods that mm -hmm. are like different things. So uh, you have to, for each kind of like curve and each thing, you have to have like a specific. Implementation somewhere. Yeah, and it needs to be like, okay, this is how it's verified. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like, go, officially like it needs to go through the W3C like standards oh, so this process. So full sta DID standard for W3C? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is actually something we're uh, pushing through, like, or working on with the uh, credentials community group in W3C. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, make that into, like, you know, a more official thing. Mm -hmm. uh, did key is, like, I guess one of the main kind of references. But I think the DAD community in general, like, a little bit doesn't really like did key because it's like, oh, but you can't rotate keys. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, but it's like super useful primitive, and I think is, I think yeah. the PKH is going to be like similarly useful to like dead key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely useful. Like even if it's, if it's not, I mean, the reason why they have named account is that you can rotate keys well and have many keys, etc. But yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. No, that's interesting. And so, so right, but like right now, for 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 this to be, you need to implement it all on the. Like yeah. on the node, pretty much, for mm -hmm. every single verification method. And then, like, even for PKHs, right, you will need to implement every single, like, sub. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, it would be nice if there was, like, an abstract way to just, like, find a, uh, you know, see a DAD method and, like, mm -hmm. find the reference implementation and, like, fetch that code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are some projects working on that type of, like, dynamic code loading, mm -hmm. uh, but none are, like, super solid yet, as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, I think like this WebAssembly is probably like the way to do it. Like, yeah, you have WebAssembly modules. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's easier for these kind of things, which is kind of like static. Yeah. Um, I think I don't know. Like, so these are like public key hashes. I guess basically based on yeah, like this is a hash yeah. of a public key, so you don't yeah. need to resolve anything. You can just like verify mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah, this you need to actually fetch the yeah, current so, set of keys. Right. Uh, so I don't know if like this PKH would actually work for near accounts. Mm -hmm. That's something that we probably need to explore. Yeah. I think and right now this, we have like this is closer to this actually, right? Because yeah, this actually resolves to set of keys that you can yeah yeah. With. And so so there are like standard interfaces for like resolving a DID. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we need like uh, it would be ideal if we could like dynamically resolve these types of things. Nice. Um, but ultimately, it kind of becomes like if the node has support for like a lot of DAD methods, that kind of puts a lot of like external dependencies uh, in terms of like trust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess I guess it would be interesting to talk about. So this did PKH. Mm -hmm. The the reason we are interested in that is we're building an object capability system uh, to do authentication into ceramic. Because right now you kind of like need some kind of system for our did you know if it's a very simple case we have a did key mm -hmm. you need to store the private key somewhere yeah and so you could generate a private key for did key in a storage in the browser um, and that's fine for like short lived things if you have a, a did three like mm -hmm. we want to keep those keys secure and right now we have a system that involves an iframe and involves like signatures is a little bit like uh, involved and like using an iframe is obviously like not like the, the, the best security practice. Yeah, the most secure thing, yeah. um, So what we want to do, uh, and let's maybe clear some space here. No, I don't think so. So we want to use the PKA just like a root identity or like as a, as a base mm -hmm. to issue capabilities to, to create streams in ceramic. And so, 
Uh, imagine we have like you know a wallet up here. This is like, and it has an address. So that's represented as it did. BKH. Um, so what what we want to do is like signing things mm -hmm. with this thing is could be done, but like that requires the walls to pop up like a signature and do that every time. Uh, so if we have if we have the DAP, right? Uh, I don't know how much space I'm gonna need for this. Uh, <laughs> we have DAP, and mm -hmm. so the DAP can. The idea for uh, for the object capability system is that we have that it can generate a, a did key, um, and then it requests an, a, a capability from the wallet, and that's basically a signature mm -hmm. that includes um, like um, domain uh, did key. I realize this might be super small. <laughs> uh, let me redo this. Uh, um, and maybe some like uh, TTL, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then caveats. So. So let's say this that wants get access to stream A mm -hmm. and stream B. Mm -hmm. um, so this is signed. And then return to the DAP, right? So they mm -hmm. get the signature. And now the, the DAP has this capability, mm -hmm. uh, this object capability, OCAP. Uh, they come from here. And if now the DAP wants to update stream A, it can simply uh, create a, a commit. So let's say we have stream A um, over here. Uh, so uh, here's the genesis, and this is stream A. So now uh, when I create an update, it's signed, uh, and this is signed by uh, the did key. Mm -hmm. And in the header of of this signature, or like the sign the things that's signed, we include uh, the OCAP. So now, like when when a ceramic node is verifying the event log, you can see like, oh, this was signed by by this dead key, but it's including an object capability, and then see that okay, this object capability was actually owned signed by this. By this wallet. Yeah, exactly. So this is like uh, you know, uh, the PKH. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this this will allow us to like have these session keys that can, maybe it gets multiple access. Maybe it can we can have like other types of caveats that like include this is you know you can only write to this particular subsection of the stream or only mm -hmm. make this particular update. Uh, so you can have like more granular permissioning uh, inside of like the data that you give um, DApps access to. Um, and one cool thing about OCAPs, we're probably not going to have, we're not going to have this in the first version, mm -hmm. but it's that in theory, this did key could live in a DAP or it could live on someone's backend or it could live yeah. wherever. Uh, but the, the wallet gives access to um, the did key here. This did key could potentially delegate it, delegate it and mm -hmm. say like, they could attenuate and say like only access to stream B mm -hmm. and not access to stream so, A. So you would just like sign with... So like, you would sign with actually this key. With, yeah, with this key. And you add... Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> and so you add like, you know, extra caveat on top of this, you know, stream B, right? Yeah, exactly. So you create like a... Yeah, and, and so this would be signed by the... The did key, yeah. The ID yeah, key. No, interesting. 
Yeah, that, I mean, it's somewhat similar to our model, but yeah, our, our model is like this and then DAP or or whatever backend, yeah, has a key. And, and so you mm -hmm. sign that you want to add key. Right. Key, you add uh, for which contract. So it's kind of the main and yeah. then which methods you can call. And you have a gas limit, pretty much gas allowance as you can, you know, just send a ton of transactions. And then, so this goes on chain. And now you can use this to send transactions right. with this. So, so in this, in this model, you have like this access list of yeah. like all, of all the, the keys, yeah. all the accounts that have access. Yeah. Whereas in here, uh, we don't need to keep the state anywhere. This DAP is responsible for keeping this whole mm -hmm. cap around and only like displaying it once, once it's used. So like including it once it's used. Yeah, I think the, the problem is like if, if your wallet displaying who did you give the permissions to yeah. like across multiple devices, that's when yeah. you so, so one, one thing you could do is actually like store OCAP. Um, store store like this OCAP could get get like permission to also write like write itself to like a, a to list. another object store, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you could have like potentially other caveats is like only if this is false. Mm -hmm. So you can have like revocation list for this. Mm. Um, and that could be like, you know, in, in theory, you could make OCAPs like very generic, like general. Uh, I think I think OCAPs is actually, the, the, when it was invented, it's like used on an operating system level mm -hmm. where having these kind of access control list is like really expensive because you, you kind of need to go, like, check them and keep track of them. Whereas here you kind of like only have this object where wherever you need it. Yeah, I mean, for sure it's, it's cheaper if, if I mean, you still may have like multi like your PKH here is itself maybe complex to verify. Like your DID here may be complex to verify, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, um, but you know, and like if if you rotate the key here, this solo cap have yeah. If you rotate the key, uh, this this O cap would be invalidated unless you know there's an anchor here. Uh, uh, th so this is anchored before mm -hmm. this. The PKH that, or yeah, yeah. I mean, some key, public key that supports key rotation, uh, then you can see like okay, that was that particular version of the DID, mm. so it's still valid. Uh, but any if they try to use this OCAP later, it wouldn't be valid. Right, so let's say like does PK, is PKH able to pull it, like pretty much how does this DID PKH or others that pull external information work, right? Because in this case, you're saying like if I'm revalidating, mm -hmm. and at this point I need to verify that this is signed by this, you know, DID PKH. But if this PKH is external, you mean if it rotates keys? Yeah, and it yeah, self rotates keys. Yeah. So so PKH is static. We can't okay, rotate PKH keys static, there. But, yes. but yeah. So so we have and like DID three. DID three. Yeah. Um, uh, and then it's like yeah, so doc, yeah, document ID. whatever. And then so what we actually do uh, when we sign thing is like mm -hmm. we actually include the the DID that signed it, and it actually points to the specific. If you remember in the DID document, there's a verification method. Mm -hmm. So you might have like multiple of the keys. Uh, so we actually like uh, have a query param here that's like uh, version mm -hmm. version ID, um, and this version ID says that. Uh, this is the particular version of the DID document that was used to sign um, to sign it, mm -hmm. and that's included in here. Um, so, um, what you like this version ID? We need to check that it was valid. Uh, it wasn't invalidated before this thing was anchored. Mm -hmm. So when you resolve a DID that has a version ID, you will also see like uh, you can get stamp of that yeah, when it, when this update will happen mm -hmm. and when the next update happened. So you can like check that uh, this anchor that came after um, actually yeah this update actually happened in that time period. Mm -hmm. So do you anchor every like as an anchoring service you run? Do you anchor every change? Like what, no, yeah, because there is like multiple changes. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't anchor every change. We right now because of like, you know Ethereum mainnet uh, expensiveness, we anchor it twice a day, um, and obviously that needs to increase mm -hmm. as, as like the, the network grows. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I mean, 
yeah, th these kind of transactions are kind of like not fi really final until it's been anchored. anchored I see. Um, yeah, because if you have, you know, change the key and then you don't have anchoring for some period of time, then like this version ID, this points to the specific document. Yeah, this points to the specific version. Oh, yeah. Per, so uh, if this is the, the stream for yeah. the 380, yeah. yeah, this points to the version ID can only point to like an anchor. So if you rotate yeah, the so keys here, yeah, yeah. So you need to point to this. Uh, uh, actually, in the implementation, we don't allow you to rotate keys until it's been anchored, and then I you see. can rotate again. Uh, but for the for for so so in three eighty, we kind of anchor every every update. Mm -hmm. uh, but in like generally in, in streams, we kind of like make a bunch of updates and then anchor, and uh, depending on like how much it's used, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think. This is definitely like where the complexity is. If you don't, if you don't check it in, right, then yeah, no, it's definitely and this thing. Uh, this was in the DAD core specification, mm -hmm. but the ability to check like when was the last update and when is the next update, that was not something that we we had to add that to mm -hmm. the DAD core, mm -hmm. and we barely got it in for like <laughs> version one. We're like, this is a bug in this thing <laughs> because otherwise it doesn't really work in trustless yeah, yeah, systems. Exactly. Yeah. And they're like trustless systems, what's that? <laughs> Like a bunch of like Web2 people uh, building this decentralized identifier spec. Well, I mean, there is a bunch of like uh, projects in the in the kind of Web3 ecosystems also like contributing. Yeah, contributing, yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, that was that was like we got that found that bug in like the last moment of mm -hmm. like being able to update the spec. Yeah, I mean, this is where like not having consensus always kind of creates problems, right? Because you don't have the time. So you, you're trying to kind of yeah, checkpoint at least some surface form, but yeah. Um, okay. No, this is cool. Do you want to talk about kind of what what are you guys thinking for the future? Yeah, we can do that. That's kind of very loosely defined. Okay. Um, but um, this works well for uh, when you have individual user identities mm -hmm. and like you want to be able to. Uh, yeah, because the, the revo revocation is mostly like you, you kind of slash your own data and your own reputation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have exp implemented uh, an experimental feature or an experimental DID method called mm -hmm. DID NFT. And obviously that allows you to like, I can update it, then I send it to you and now you can update the stream. Yeah. And so there this kind of data withholding attack that we talked about is problematic because um, people can you know, if I create this NFT, I make a bunch of updates and like now you see like, oh, that's super cool. Like I want to have it and I send it to you. Then yeah, I can kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can always look at, you can always like look at the history of the data and like the things that will change and like remake it to that version. Yeah. yeah. But it's like for, for the experience of that, it's really bad. But, but um, also like how does this work with this problem? Like let, because you, you change the owner, right? If you give an all cap with an NFT and then you, you sell the NFT but you still have an OCAP. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess like an OCAP would be revoked at the time of transfer. And of transfer, but anything that was, you know, issued before and like used before mm -hmm. would still be valid because it would be at the time. Uh, there's like a lot of complications. So ideally we would make this kind of like general to any blockchain, but there's complications like querying the historical state of well, blockchains. Exactly. That's what is, because like now in your version ID is actually like some hash of a block or something. Yeah, know? so with version ID, we're actually using version time now. And for we have this implemented for uh, a few different Ethereum chains. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's essentially like you take the version time, you use the graph to basically look up what the state of that, who the owner of that NFT was mm -hmm. at that point in time. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but yeah, so for, for this type of, of thing, the, the, the streams that we talked about isn't really kind of ideal. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the reasons we want to introduce like a, um, a, a blockchain where you have streams represented just as objects on chain. Mm -hmm. uh, you can still have this kind of like event log that happened yeah. uh, and kind of verify the history independently that it's actually like signed by uh, the right user so that, you know, the if there's like an attack by validators or whatever, they can't actually like fake which mm -hmm. transaction took place. Um, 
but yeah, and, and that you can, and we still want to keep this kind of property of like every stream being completely independent. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so you can kind of like sync only the data pieces that you're interested in. Um, but yeah, like I don't know how much it makes sense to dive into that right now. It's like very early in in uh, kind of research and development. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the what we're going for there. So mm -hmm. that that would be like. Uh, that uh, ideally it's, uh, it's also solving a different problem right also because like uh, one problem with this right now is that you have to run your own ceramic node yeah or you trust a third party to run a node for mo most users are not going to do that so the, the the blockchain could potentially also provide like a service where you pay mm -hmm. and actually yeah, have, have, these, data and then, have yeah. these streams maintained mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah makes sense anything else we should cover Mm. No, I think that's actually like everything I was thinking about. Um, I guess, well, it, it could make sense to cover kind of, we have a framework like how you use Ceramic mm -hmm. on top um, called Self ID. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a way kind of like to um, allow interoperability of data between applications. Um, so we, we could just go like a brief overview of that. Sure, yeah. Right, so self ID. Um, we also sometimes call it IDX. It's more specifically like the, the data structure of, of this thing. Um, but conceptually, you can think of it as a big user table. Mm -hmm. So here we have um, the IDs. So we have like the DKH or mm -hmm the three or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then the columns. Uh, so, so if you imagine you're building like a, you wanna build like a user table that is shared across the internet. Now if someone goes here and like, okay, developer, I wanna have a name for my user. Mm -hmm. So application A might store that as like, you know, a string. Mm -hmm. But application B might store as, you know, like uh, an object. It's like um, name string and surname. Oh, <laughs> this is difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Also string. And so a user that comes to Application A, like creates a name that comes to application B. Application B is broken. Mm -hmm. Like this, yeah, this is problematic. Thing, yeah. <laughs> it's problematic. So um, we can't have this, right? Mm -hmm. This is bad. Uh, so we need a way for developers to kind of define claim things. names or define define things. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we have something called data models. Uh, so data model is essentially um, uh, they are represented as a stream in ceramic. Mm -hmm. So we have um, data model one, and it is represented as like a stream ID. Mm -hmm. And this might say like, okay, this is this data you can find in here is, you know, has the structure of. Uh, well, like specific, yeah, specific name, string, mm -hmm. uh, emo your favorite emoji. Uh, I guess that's also like a string. Enum. <laughs> yeah, it was string, but like two yeah, characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, and then now, like, someone creates, goes to an application and creates an entry here. Uh, when they're writing to the stream, mm -hmm. uh, this one thing I didn't mention in the protocol, we have like a, an additional feature that allows you to specify a JSON schema mm -hmm. for, for a stream. For the whole stream? Yeah. At, so, at so, Genesis? Or? Yeah, at Genesis. But you can change it, but like you cannot, like, so you can also like not allow it to be changed. Mm -hmm. 
but basically you specify a, a, a JSON schema and then the state object needs to conform to that JSON schema. Mm -hmm. So this schema can be defined in a data model and the data model also contains like other metadata like you know, the name, some description maybe, um, potentially like other metadata in the future. And so an application um, developer that sees like, okay, this data model one here is super useful for my application. Mm -hmm. can, they can just like import this into their, uh, their app and then start pulling that from all the users that, mm -hmm. that come to their application. And they can be certain that the data that will get out of this data model is of this format. But you said this data model itself is a stream, right? So it can be updated. It can be updated, yeah. So um, it's going to happen there. So yeah, I mean, so this is like a problem in general in these types of, um, of systems where you want to be able to have updates over time. But if you're building an application, you might not want to, you know, limit yourself to one one schema. Uh, so there's actually like a lot of research going into like how can we have schemas that we can change over time mm -hmm. but allows us to have the data uh, kind of change with the schema. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like an unsolved problem still. Probably like a good first approach to this is just like not allow the to schema to be changed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's like provides, you know, solid foundation until mm -hmm. those types of systems are more available. Uh, I feel like, yeah, data models being more permanent, right, and kind of... But really, yeah, I guess like the data model itself doesn't ones. need to be permanent. Like you might want to have, um, you know, the, the schema be permanent, but maybe you want to change like how the data is backed up. Or, like how... I see. There's uh, more, more metadata there. Yeah, there might be more metadata. Maybe you change the description over time mm -hmm. or, yeah, there's like potentially other things you might want to store in this metadata. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's essentially a way to like for developers to find why should I use this data model? This is, like it seems useful. Mm -hmm. And so so then you can have like a, an infinite amount of like columns yeah. here essentially. Uh, and then you have a discovery problem, which is like which columns should I use? Right. So then the discovery problem. Uh, so that needs some other type of system. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know we can start thinking about that more once we run into that. We have more of those, yeah. <laughs> No, this is cool, yeah. Uh, so yeah, th this is kind of just simple, the framework. And then so so a, an individual user mm -hmm. uh, store has a stream that stores the um, uh, their row, mm -hmm. and then there's an individual stream for each cell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so when you say stores a row, they have a stream which, or like th th they just have a JSON which has like uh, DM1 to another stream ID. Yeah. So DM2, so it's like just a... Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a key value store. Okay. Um, and obviously like if you have a JSON object like that, that's gonna, if it grows very big, it's a problem. Yeah. So what we wanna do is introduce a new stream type that's uh, used as something called a hunt, uh, and hash array map tree. And essentially like a Merkle tree that has like a, N or key, K bucket mm -hmm. uh, and use, use that as like a key value store. I see. Yeah, that's kind of the question I had is like how scalable this all is given the current model. Yeah, yeah, no, so, so in, the, in this current model like you will run into problems when you one know, document is large. One document is really large and so that's kind of like um, one of our, our main focus next year is like in, or, uh, introducing these ty new types of stream types that allows you to have like a, uh, this a hand type of key value store mm -hmm. and doing similar things for like lists. But also like, I mean, obviously this all independent structure, so potentially you can shard the hell out of them, but how shard, how scalable is this right now? Uh, which aspect? Well, like the number of streams, like for example, that people can do in parallel and update in parallel. Oh, that an individual user can do in parallel or that a node can handle? That a node can handle. Yeah, I mean, uh, it depends on how much resources your node has. <laughs> but like... That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you said, like you can have multiple nodes that pin different... Yeah, different subsets. Yeah, yeah. so, so that's already kind of like... It, it's kind of on-demand charging pretty much. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you can think of it like that, yeah. yeah. And so if you're getting like destroyed by some streams, you can like unpin them potentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, cool. But yeah, I guess like yeah, as document grows for yeah, I mean that's, that's definitely that's a problem where, that yeah. needs solving. Yeah, I mean like 
it's interesting to think like yeah what what's uh so you're trying to kind of Merkel, like have a Merkle hash table here, right? So yeah, exactly. Uh, so that that could itself be stored in like an IPLD mm -hmm. representation. So you could like, as so you know, potentially like a live client of the stream. Mm -hmm. You don't need to like sync the entire tree, right? You sync only the just subset that you need. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because it's not. It's it's getting closer and closer to what you know we all do for blockchains, where we have like a Merkleized hash table. Mm -hmm. Underneath, right? So, right, but you might have like for different use cases, you might have different, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, different, different data structures. Different like the the, yeah. the 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 like the, the Merkleized tree is like very useful for or like the the Hamd kind of like symmetric trees are mm -hmm. useful for uh, key value store. But if you're making a list, you probably want to have a different structure. Yeah, uh, and depending on like which direction and which way you want to iterate quickly through the mm -hmm. list, you have different data structures for those. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we right now like each smart contract just has a key value store pretty mm. much for it, and so and then link like lists etc. implemented on top. Right. So we just have like. So it's it's yeah it's it's a hash map essentially. Yeah, it's a hash map for for each contract, and then they have permissions to write it to mutate it. Yeah. Yeah. And then underneath is like a Merkleized try pretty much to to mm -hmm. resolve that. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, I think that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, tune in for more episodes coming soon, I hope. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. So maybe before this, like, which problems Ramek is solving? That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>